Okay, everyone, we're online. Good to go whenever you're ready. Oh, thanks, Gilberto. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ameriflux webinar. And this is the right place for you. And uh, while we are waiting for other people to join, um, we do have a, a pool everywhere survey. So maybe take your chance to go to the, uh, the link here or maybe text and tell us where you're from while we're waiting for others. How about this? Okay. 
Yeah, sorry for the technical di difficulty. I'll try again. Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, webinar of the Ameriflux uh, webinar series. So today we're going to talk about the post-submission data lifecycle and from the uh, so-called FPE to the uh, base publishing. Uh, just a teaser, so FPE refer to the file format uh, you submit to Ameriflux. And by the end, uh, the data we get published by Ameriflux, a so-called base product, so and shared to the uh, data user. And today we are going to cover what happened uh, during this process. And I'm Hao Sen Chu from Ameriflux team, and together with uh, Daniel Christensen, we'll be talking through the presentation. I just want to mention we do have a great data team here, as I show in a photo, and they will be stay behind the thing, but always uh, try to jump in and answer any question if needed. Uh, just some ground rule for today's webinar. So um, who should join? Uh, if you from a side team and want to submit your data or have been submitted the data to Ameriflux, I'm talking about Flux Met data, and this is the right place. Or maybe you're a data user, you want to know about how to use the data, maybe I'll try to understand what happened during this uh, so-called Ameriflux uh, pipeline. And this is uh, also the right place for you. Uh, we plan to uh, spend roughly 40 minutes uh, cover the presentation and give an overview of the pipeline. Uh, maybe how some tips about how to prepare your data for submission and some of the QQC step uh, eventually and uh, talk about what happened after the data got published. We do have uh, roughly 20 minutes for Q&A and uh, we also have a couple of survey through the presentation. So welcome to jump in. Uh, the webinar will be recorded as uh, the presentation and the video will be made available uh, pretty soon on the Mayflux website. Uh, I encourage everyone to stay muted during the presentation, but you're welcome to unmute yourself for Q&A uh, in the end of this uh, webinar. And you can always use the chat window to uh, send message or if, uh, if you have any question, uh, feel free to jump in anytime. Okay, uh, to start with uh, as today, uh, there are more than 500 sites uh, in Ameriflux. As you can see from the map here, it shows the location of the site, but also the length of the data record, and also the very beautiful picture from everywhere. And this is the uh, reality we are facing. So a lot of people doing very cool, I mean, very hot science all around the American, America, sorry. And how can we make this uh, data available to each other so we can do some cool or hot science all together? And in the earlier days, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, maybe you can collect your data and send a spreadsheet to someone who wants to use the data. And this might be achievable. But since we have more than a couple hundred of a site right now, uh, maybe a couple thousand of data users right now. So it becomes almost impossible. Just try to send your spreadsheet everywhere and use your own format and et cetera. So that's why in the last couple of years, um, the Ameriflux management project, uh, the team been working hard, try to build a new pipeline. We call Ameriflux FluxMed data pipeline. The idea is try to enable the synthesis across many sites, also many data users. And a couple of important feature for this pipeline is uh, we need to be able to process the data in a timely manner and traceability, of course but also try to minimize the human effort as possible because uh, we're dealing with a new reality. And working with our partner from the international other uh, Flux network, we uh, established, but also adopted the new uh, Flux processing standard format with so-called FP format. I will talk about that later. And we also established a, a series of the QC standard uh, make sure the data meet the criteria when shared to a data user. And last, uh, but not least to mention is about data versioning and citation and also the metadata. How can we enable all of this? Okay, so let's take a look inside a black box about this uh, pipeline and see what happened in there. Uh, starting with the upper left, 
uh, when a site team submit the data to a Mariflux, the data get into a series of uh, different steps into the pipeline. Uh, the uh, orange or maybe the pink box here. Uh, so started with the format QQC, we'll talk about detail later, and data QQC to check the, the file, the data, make the standard of the format and also the, uh, the content of the data. If anything need to be addressed, you see an iteration here. We'll be sent back to the site team and make sure everything got fixed, or maybe addressed before move on to the publish. If everything got addressed and everything went right, uh, the data would be published as so-called base data product. Uh, some idea, summary about the data, base data product. So the data is provided as uh, submitted by the site team. So whatever variable, whatever processing, or get fitting or not, uh, if everything passed, we serve to the, to the data user. <clears throat> we focus on the general data quality and also all the FP variable will be supported. So there are many variables. We'll talk about that later. And uh, base products support all kinds of aggregation. So from a single sensor data, all the way to the layer aggregate value, we all support it, okay? And also not to mention that the, the pipeline doesn't end here. Uh, the, the, the base data product will be made available to data user, but the pipeline doesn't end here. We do, um, uh, working hard to construct a new uh, one flux pipeline uh, will be taking the base data data product and eventually publish as a flux net data product. So slightly different compared to base, flux data product is uh, value added with a gap fitting, partitioning, uncertainty, estimation. Also a little bit more QQC based on the requirement. We focus on only the subset of the data, not everything here, and also it's uh, aggregate product. So for today's talk, we probably won't talk too much about OneFlux. If you have interest, there's another webinar uh, last October. The video is available. You can go there and check it out. I also want to mention when preparing this webinar, we also launched a couple uh, web page, uh, detail some of the data processing pipeline, what happened and some of the detail of the check. And always feel free to check it out if you feel uh, miss, us, miss something during this presentation. Uh, some idea about the timeline for each of the step, just make sure you can follow. So for format QQC, once you upload your file, uh, it kick out immediately. So you probably will receive the format QQC report maybe 15 minutes or maybe less than an hour, you should. And if anything need to be addressed, you will take back to the site team in our experience, it takes roughly one or two days sometimes to address the issue and resubmit the data again. It'll be here. And once move along into the data QQC, we typically review the data QQC maybe um, every month or every two months. It depends on we all we have a, a batch of the uh, case need to review. Then we send back the data QQC review back to the site team. And in our experience, it might take one or two, one to four months to address the issue and resubmit the data again, depends on the comp complexity of the issue. Eventually, if everything went right and the data we publish as a base, uh, the publishing cycle is right now is every month, every, every, or every two months, depends. Okay, so think about the best scenario. If everything went right from the time you submit your data to the time make available to a data user, it could take two months, the best scenario. But in practical cases, it depends how many iteration you needed to get through the process, okay? So before we move into the detail of the format, format QQC, we do have two survey we would like to know uh, your past experience. So the first one is, have you submitted data, FluxMed data to a Mariflux in the last four years? So the four years refer to the time we rebuild a new uh, pipeline we just mentioned earlier. So let us know if you have any experience about doing that.
Well, that's great. Looks like many people have many experience. <laughs> we'll wait maybe a, a minute. Okay, I think the pool stabilized. So we do have a majority of people who have some experience. So next. Next question. Okay, so how often, if you have submitted your data or plan to submit your data, how often did you plan or submit your data for a site? Uh, I want to mention this is. Uh, the best scenario. So you don't, if you don't have to do, make a couple of iteration to make correction or anything, how often did you plan to submit your data? More than once a year or maybe once a year? Great. I think we have a lot of a lot of cases uh, people submit regularly, but also people uh, tend to submit once a year. Okay, let's jump to the next one. So I would like uh, Daniel take over. Great, thanks, Jason. Hi, everyone. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, and we really look forward to hearing feedback from all of you, um, especially on uh, the experiences you've had in the Q&A. Um, so before we step into the, the format QAQC portion of the webinar, I want to alert everyone to the, um, to the web page that we have where you can track your data once you have submitted it. So once you have submitted something, you will be able to look at this, uh, go to this URL and see just your sites um, where they are in the process. So that's a resource for you. Okay. So um, next slide. So before we jump into um, the actual mechanics of what happens in the format QAQC, I wanted to highlight a few things to do to prepare your data for the smoothest uh, submission possible. So first, of course, you have to have your site. You need to be registered. Your site needs to be registered. And um, what we're showing here is the upload portal will, once you're done preparing your data, you would go to upload the data. But let's talk a minute first about this FP standard format um, and where you find out information about that. So next slide, housing. Um, so this is the um, half hourly, hourly data upload format page, also known as format, um, FPN format. So a few things I wanna point out here um, are first, um, the data processing link in that list of bulleted points there. Housing, if you can advance. Ooh. Huh, that didn't show up. Okay, um, I'll come back to that. So Housing mentioned earlier that we do support a list of common variable names. So you can find that list here on this page by linking uh, to this table. So it's really important that you use the exact variable name and also the units because we will be checking for that. 
And as I mentioned, the, in that bulleted list, the data processing link, the very first one in the list, um, that's an important place for you to look to find out what, what to do to your data. Like, for example, we do want you to remove any known bad data points from sensor malfunction or any other errors like that. And also, of course, we don't want you to um, use star filter your, your flux data that you're submitting. So there's a bunch of other things in there that um, you'll find uh, important to pay attention to. So next. So um, for the file format specification, this we do accept files that have any time period um, in the file. Um, it's a comma delimited file with a single line of the headers. And then really importantly is that these first two columns are the timestamp start and timestamp end in the ISO format there. And then for the rest of the columns, you can order them in any order and the variables that you submit depend on which of course you're collecting at your site. And if you note about the common issues that we find, by far the most common issue we find is um, that sometimes the timestamps get converted to scientific notation. We find that this often happens when folks use Excel to um, do a little cleanup on their files before submission. So Excel automatically likes to format these long integers into scientific notation, and then we lose all the, the resolution. Um, here's another, the list I'll let you browse through of other issues that we um, sometimes find and point out that um, for the variable names that we showed earlier can be um, appended by several qualifiers. And we have a resource online for you to get a lot more information about how to use those qualifiers um, correctly, including the gap fill and the PI qualifiers, as well as the um, positional qualifiers. So what actually happens once you upload? Um, as Hausen mentioned, the process, uh, the format process begins automatically. It's totally, completely automated, the whole thing. And you should receive a report emailed to you about 15 minutes after upload. We do the evaluation on a per file basis. So you can upload many files at once, but each file gets its own report. Uh, so looking at this diagram, uh, we run the tests. Um, if needed, we sometimes make one attempt to autocorrect particular issues. If we do make that attempt, we run the tests again. And then what happens is you see in the, the call out number two, you get an overall status and a recommended team action. Now, if you get a pass or a warning, the file itself is automatically queued for the data QAQC process. If we do have some checks that fail, um, it will the, we will ask you to resubmit. But we will want to point out that if you do get a warning, it's important, uh, we highly recommend that you take a look at what, what we found because some of the issues could potentially affect data QAQC. And we will go ahead and queue that file for further processing unless we hear from you and get a resubmission. So um, this is what the report looks like in your inbox. Um, you can see in the subject line, you'll get kind of an overall message of, of what you need to do. And then in the boxes there in orange are the individual uh, reports for each file that you uploaded. And when you click on one of those links, you'll go to our webpage and see the report, um, which comes in three flavors. Um, again, the pass and warning will automatically get queued for the next step in the process. Um, if you get a fail report, you, we definitely have to have you take some action and, and resubmit um, a data file to us. So let's dig into a few key points on the report itself. I'm gonna use the warning report because that's the most common type of output or results that we have. So you can see that um, there's an overall status message and the site team action right at the top. Um, if an auto-corrected attempt was made, you'll see the main result of the auto-corrected report there. And it's important to look at um, the auto-corrections there in the, the orange box in the middle. Um, to really make sure like what we changed in your file is something you agree with. So, and we work again, again, that you reviewed the entire test results. And then we do include at the bottom there, you'll see you can open up the, the report of the original uploaded file. But if you get a pass or a fail um, report, the report will just be based on that uploaded file in most cases. So I think um, now back to Hausen. Well, thank you. Thank you. So the data QQC are started uh, after the file passed uh, format QQC. I want to mention 
And this typically happens when all the recent submitted files pass from a queue QC. So we don't queue single file, we queue all of them together. And if you have any previous published base file, and we'll first combine the new file with your previous one. So over, override or maybe just uh, combine them in time and then kick off the DIQQC process. And after this, a series of uh, a statistic and also figure will be generated. And the uh, MFLUX team will be working to review this uh, statistic and try to compile them and compose them into a, a summary report sent back to you. If everything went right and this uh, uh, file will be moved on to a uh, base publication, and otherwise, if anything uh, potential issue was un I was identified, will be uh, returned back to to the site team for correction or maybe sometime for clarify the issue. Uh, I want to mention uh, the idea of this uh, data QQC is try to serve as a secondary check. So we're not doing the primary check um, to replace the site team's QQC effort. And secondary. Um, we, we don't do any data filtering or correction during this process. So if any issue be identified, it need to be addressed by resubmission through the process. Okay. So let's take a look about what's uh, inside the IQQC. I want to point out uh, some of the methodology we uh, was ad adapted from the earlier paper by Gilberto Pastorella here. Uh, this is a DOI. I encourage everyone to take a look and maybe try to implement some of the idea in your uh, primary QQC. <clears throat> and also we, uh, the, this QQC was adopted in all the FluxNet 2015 processing and including all the base data product published since 2017. So a couple hundred sites already. And here's the list of the module we currently have in our DIQQC. QQC. I won't go through each one of them. I will try to give a few examples for the first two. And as I mentioned earlier, we do launch a couple of websites. So you can always go to the website to check the detail for each one of them. Okay. So let's talk about the uh, one of the major um, uh, check we do is for the timestamp alignment check. Uh, sometimes we call timestamp shift check. And the check started with, uh, we calculate the potential incoming radiation for, for a site for a given period of time. So this is kind of the top of the atmosphere incoming radiation, the maximum possible radiation for the site. And we do this for the any data uh, period. Once we, do, we have this potential incoming radiation, we calculate the 15 days uh, maximum diurnal composite a new time series. And this was done for both the potential incoming radiation, but also for all the observed radiation from your data. And we check alignment of these two, okay? As a show figure here. Ideally, everything should fall below the potential incoming radiation, okay? And the reason we are doing a 15 day maximum composite is what we want to focus on the clear day condition as possible. So give us a, a better uh, shape of the time series here. So we check if any data point, a lot of data points uh, actually larger than the potential incoming radiation. But also we do uh, calculate the uh, cross correlation between all these time series to see if they align. And we focus on the, what is the maximum cross correlation and the time lag of that, okay? So one example here, uh, if you take a look, the same figure, and for this side, for this case, we do see a lot of uh, larger than potential incoming radiation happen, especially in the earlier morning. And this happened through most of the window. So each one of these is a 15 day window. So through pre pretty much all the window of the year. And the cross correlation show that uh, the maximum correlation happened at the time lag of two, so roughly one hour. So in this case, it's very likely uh, the time stamp uh, provided in the data is not aligned with the time stamp, the time zones specified by the, by the metadata. And we see that some, uh, in some of the case. And sometimes, sometimes the shift could be just one step, a half hour, and usually happen when the, uh, there's something misinterpreted during the data processing end or beginning of the time. 
And sometimes this happens just for uh, using a daylight saving, so not happen consistently across all the window, or maybe sometimes just resetting a clock. Another check we do is we do a multivariate comparison, and this is done by a pair of the variable. We anticipate there are certain relationship between these two, for example, like a, a incoming showway radiation and an incoming PVFD. And I think this uh, certain relationship can be established for a psi, and this relationship should be relative constant uh, across time. That's what I mean. So when we do the check, uh, first we plot the yearly data on the right panel. So this is a one year time series for PPFD and also the show incoming radiation. And we plot a scalar plot for these two and generate a regression of this uh, relationship. Then we try to identify all the points as a relative far away from the regression line. We uh, identify this as an outlier. And for a one year of data, we can use this uh, check to identify any uh, short-term inconsistency between these two. For example, in this case, uh, one of the radiation sensors shaded. So you do see the one of them is periodically lower than the other one, okay? And sometimes can be identified uh, the sensor got covered by snow or litter fall or some other thing. Uh, for size with the longer data, we do check the regression slope uh, from year to year. Uh, this is showing here. Uh, again, a uh, 10 years of time series plot on the right hand side for PPMD and the show incoming. And on the left hand, this is the, the yearly regression slope from year to year. As you can see, uh, the regression slope change change a lot from year to year, and the difference could be up to almost 20%, depends. And if you look at the full range of this variable, show income is relative constant uh, across this 10 year period. But PVFD do show a shift, maybe a decline of the full range from year to year. So this could be indication of one of the sensors either degraded or maybe uh, you just replace the sensor, they have a different full range, et cetera. So uh, once we finish all the data QQC, we try to compile them into a summary report I mentioned earlier. So this is an example of the email. You probably will see that, or maybe you, you saw that several times already. And uh, several components in the email. So a, a quick summary about, about your data QQC. And I try to, uh, we try to list the, uh, the identify issue here, i show in the second part. And we try to provide an additional link to the figure to help you uh, uh, understand what's going on and maybe have a way to uh, resolve the issue as possible. And last, uh, all the statistic and figure, uh, maybe also, for example, like a potential radiation I just mentioned, they all hosted here through the additional link. So it's always good to check other additional figure and to figure out what, what happened to your data. So before we wrap up and moving on to the last part of the QQC pipeline, I want to uh, welcome a couple of guests here. So um, this are uh, just a reason uh, citing just make their data into the pipeline. And some of them uh, just got published uh, maybe last month or a few months ago. And I believe some of them still working on. And so we would like to hear them feedback and also especially what can be improved about, uh, about uh, QQC pipeline. So first we do, ha we have a uh, John No uh, from USDA ARS, uh, Southwest uh, Watershed Research Center. And uh, he's, uh, he's the data manager for the Mountain Bigelow site and also uh, two other uh, alpine in the Niwa Ridge. Uh, we would like to hear from you, John, if you can unmute yourself. All right, I'm here. Um, I was asked to just for one minute, uh, touch on uh, my motivation, my uh, um, the best thing about this and the challenges associated with data submission to Ameriflux. So um, for me, the motivation, it's, it's been the best way to get these data that we've worked, you know, poured so much of our energy and resources into out to, to other users. Um, so for me personally, just the uh, really noticed the difference once the data get uh, online. Um, the best part of it, I'd say, you know, you 
just did a great job going through the Q, QC process, the independent check, and especially some of the quantitative outputs, um, data and graphs that have helped me to notice things that I never noticed about my data in the first place. And uh, challenges, you know, honestly, for me, it's probably getting started and then carving out the time to do kind of a larger um, project. There's some inertia at the beginning, but um, for anybody that was in the fence, not sure, uh, it's, it's really, it's just been well worth it for me. Oh, great. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah, it's always hard for the first timer and we had try to do our best <laughs> to improve that. Uh, so our next guest is the Alejandro uh, Cueva, Alejandro Cueva. So he's from uh, Arizona State University. And he also, he, he is a data manager of the El Mongo site in uh, Baja, California, Mexico, actually. Hey, so Alex, yes. flow is hey. yours. And thank you, and thank you for the invitation. So, also the three questions from uh, are the motivation. So, from the perspective of Mexico, uh, we want to share our data uh, towards a continental scale database. That's the first motivation uh, to submit this data, and also to put the data in the right place because there are, there are another uh, repositories. But I think that we are going to have visualization uh, if we submit it in 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 Ameriflux. Uh, the second part is the what do I like the best? So I think that the so the, the, submit, the submitting process is really straight, uh, straightforward. And also I have, to, I have to thank for all the technical support from all the team. Uh, it has been uh, super easy for me. I'm also a first timer, a first timing uh, 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 submitting data. So uh, it's, it's something that it was really encouraging to having all your support. And the most challenging about uh, the, mo the most challenging thing about the process, I think that is before submitting the data is all the uncertainty that we have about if we have the data, the, the correct data, you know. So then there is the evaluation, and at the end, I have to say that is something really rewarding that we have the data correct after all the QAQC process, and that's all for me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, the last, we do have uh, um, Marguerite uh, Maurice Tozer. So she's from uh, University of Texas, uh, El Paso. Uh, she's also a data manager of the Honada Experimental Ranch at Long Term Uh Unfortunately, Marguerite couldn't make it. She has a conflict schedule, but she sent a video last night. And so we're gonna try to take a look um, my motivation for contributing basically is to be part of the network, um, to share the data that we have uh, with the community uh, so that it can be discovered by others, so that it can be used for others and the, the opportunity that creates for uh, collaborations and inclusion in various synthesis activities. Um, what I liked best about the process of QAQC is that it was an opportunity to get a second pair of eyes on the data, which is really, really helpful. Um, and having access to the expertise of the Ameriflux team, learning how they approach QAQC, seeing what their QAQC checks are so that I can integrate those into mine to avoid errors uh, before I even submit the data. Um, and then also uh, getting their input and advice. I thought that communication was the, with the team was really good and I got really helpful and really thoughtful uh, responses to questions that I had when I wasn't sure exactly how to address some of the QAQC issues. Um, so that was really awesome. Um, I think that that's a huge bonus of the process. Um, and in, in, the, uh, in the feedback that you get from the QAQC, there's a written description of what the issues are, as well as a graphic description of what the issues are. And I really liked the graphic component of that because it helped me uh, understand a little bit better what was wrong with the data and think then about what I could do to fix it um, and to address those, um, address those issues. Um, most challenging, uh, really, um, just getting the data ready and and getting it all prepared there's a lot of formatting 
um, and for very for all the processes that the data goes through before it's a final data set, every step kind of needs slightly different formatting. And so staying on top of the formatting and getting all of those little details right, I found um, not a challenge, but just something to pay a lot of attention to that took a lot of time initially to set up. Now that I have it, it'll be pretty quick. Um, so <clears throat> I think we do need to move on. I'll just try to catch up. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, my motive. Great. Go ahead, Daniel. Thanks, John, Alex, and Marguerite. Um, so the last bit we'll talk about here is what happens after all the QAQC uh, analysis has been completed and, and the data have, have passed with flying colors. Um, we then get it ready to publish and make available um, to the data users on our website. So to do that, we do version the data. It's a two uh, numbered version. The first part of the version is dependent on the data. So if you are adding new time steps to your data record or you've replaced um, data because you've reprocessed or, or fixed something um, along the data record, that data version will increase. Um, and then the second part is a processing version number, which is an indication of what um, uh, version of the pipeline we're using to, uh, to, to do the QAQC analysis. And the reasons those, that number would increase would be, for example, if we add a new a data QAQC module that brings a new um, set of analyses into the picture. Or for example, early on, we misapplied um, one of the, the, the PI qualifier to some of the variables. Um, so we had to redo that and we upped the processing number in that case. So um, you can find this versioning number in various places on the file name of the data product in the zip file on the download log. So once we'll show you that later, um, but we do track who's downloading your data. Um, on the change log, you can hover over the site name and see what version was published um, at what time. And very soon, we're gonna be adding the version number to the DOIs and we'll talk touch on that a bit more later. Okay, um, so we do bundle the base data product with each site's BATM and zip it up together. Um, and that's what folks actually download on the site. And I believe the next slide we show um, here, the data change log on the left so you can see each time we do a publish event, um, you'll see which sites um, are new to have data uh, available and which sites got their data up, up uh, date, which sites got their data updated. Uh, and on the right here, you can see the download page where folks go to download your data. And I want to point out that we have a new way of selecting sites for download. There's, it's, we expanded the ways you can um, select which sites you want to download here. So have a look, um, and then. Um, the other thing we want to point out is the metadata, the most important metadata we feel for these FluxMet data are the uh, height of uh, where the observation is taking place and the model, uh, this, the instrument model that's used to collect the data. So right now we're collecting uh, those data via an online uh, variable information tool. And um, those data get put out in what we're calling the measurement height data product that you can download um, from the website. And I believe we have some images on the next slide of the tool. So this is the tool with the URL there, the first URL, where you should go um, every time you've submitted your data and, and it's getting ready for publish just to make sure that these uh, metadata are up to date. And there's a bunch of tricks um, for doing this. So have a look at the instructions that are available here, contact us with questions. Um, and then the second link is to where you can download those metadata for the Flux uh, uh, Met base product. Okay, and finally, just a few notes about the DOI. Um, so the DOI only gets assigned once your base uh, data product is made available and it's per site. So you won't have one until you have a data published for the first time. Um, we are, as I mentioned, going to be uh, updating the DOI citation to include the version that, um, the most recent version that was published. And I'd like to point out that I think just this a year ago about, we made available an a way for the site teams to specify Oh, pretty fine grainly who should be DOI's authors. And this is disconnected from your site team membership list. So you can, and you can order the authors, you can put in specific dates that certain people contributed and you can do that. You can get to that um, online editor via your site info page on the bottom tab. So I think this last slide just points out the site um, info page that every site, once you register, you get. 
And um, I believe the next that we're going to point out is that DOI tab where you can find the DOI for the base bottom product there. Um, and then secondly, this is a data use log where we track all the downloads of um, your base product. And if you've been involved with FluxNet or you'll also find your FluxNet downloads there as well. Um, so yeah, I think um, with that, um, we just wanna end on the note that a reminder that we do require users, users to follow the AmeriFlux data policy, which right now requires them, if they're gonna be using the data for publication to reach out to the site teams for potential collaboration. Um, you can find all the details at this um, main link here. I also wanna point out that we are considering, um, and the network has been having a discussion about moving to a more open data policy called CC BY 4. Um, this was discussed in last fall's November 16 webinar. So again, you can see, get go to that link and watch the video and reach out to us with any questions. We think um, this will open up a lot more opportunities for sharing data if the network decides that's the way to go. So I think with that, um, we have a few more survey questions to wrap up here. And we can do this pretty quick because I think we want to have some Q&A. Um, but if you could select um, the two most valuable aspects for you, if you have or think you might be submitting to the pipeline, um, what the most valuable aspects yeah, are. I'll just give folks a minute, to see how this plays out. Great. So it's looking like we might have a, most people interested in the independent check and then a lot of variety in the, the kind of secondary um, reasons that folks are submitting. This is great. I think we should jump to the final poll question and then we can open it up. So this last one is, um, as you know, we really uh, invite and welcome feedback because we want to, you know, we're here at the Ameriflux Management Project to make the network stronger. So we would love your feedback on um, how we can improve this process and uh, to help you do better science. And I think um, while this poll is playing out, I think we could start opening it up for questions. So if um, I think people should be able to unmute themselves now and we can um, open the floor up. Daniel, uh, Joe had a question ab about that is thematic to the poll that's going on right now. Uh, Joe, would you like to unmute yourself and, and bring your question to the floor? Yeah, hello everyone. Um, can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, the question I asked was whether these tools can be made available for us to use on our own. Um, you know, you guys have put a whole lot of work into be developing these tools and I think they're, what they do is pretty good. Um, and, and, you know, to cut down on the turnaround on some of this data, if we had these tools to be able to self-check ourselves before we, submit the data to you all, maybe you wouldn't have to spend so much time <laughs> trying to find all the problems that we missed in the first place. So um, either either an online tool that we can use through a web browser, I think is great, um, or, or some standalone software that could be downloaded and, and run on our local machines. Either way, I think it be, would be fine. Thanks, it looks like a lot of people agree with you. Um, according to this poll. So um, I think um, 
this is something we are definitely um, thinking about and, and if folks have particular suggestions of an online tool versus a standalone software, please, please let us know. We are, um, this is in the queue <laughs> for, to develop. It's great to hear that it's important to others. We do, uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have another question from uh, Jiro Flegge. Uh, so he mentioned about, it's about data change log. Oh, so where could I document the change in the data processing from one DOI to another one? For example, I changed uh, from plan of it to a different coordinate, coordinate rotation method. That's a really good question. Um, don't believe we have a standard way of communicating that information to users, um, except for you could put it in the, the online variable information tool in the comment field for the variables that are selected um, that this change has been made. Um, Yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't think we have anything available right now to, for the processing level. Maybe processing difference. Yeah, we do have something built for uh, if you have a change of the sensor or maybe a change of the aggregation, etc. But not for processing step. Um, but if it, this is something the community want, we should probably look into that. So maybe a change log or maybe something more detailed. Could be something to do in the future. We're looking into that. Thanks for the question. I have a question. Hi, Andy. Hi. Um, the people who download our data, um, you know, they have a version number as you as you just went over. If the version number changes, and you have a record of of who's downloaded the data. Are they notified that there's been a version update in your data? Not currently. Okay. If, that, if, if that's something um, you know, we hear from the community again, like if that we would, we can put that on the list. Okay. Was, I could see an issue where, you know, you discover at some point after you've submitted the data, you know, maybe even a year or so later that there was an issue that caused you know, a 5% error or 10% error or, you know, some, some of the times or all of the time or, you know, that kind of a thing. And you corrected that and resubmitted the data, then it would be the user's responsibility to be aware that the version had changed. And I'm not sure, you know, that that would happen uh, often or, or how easily that would happen. Yeah, we, we don't have that right now, but I think, this is brought up by a couple of times by different um, different site team. Uh, that's another way. So uh, I think in your site page, uh, there's a data download log, which document all the user download your data and their contact email or something like that. So sometimes if there's something major happened to your data version, for example, change from something to something and you replace every or your previous record, you want to make all your user know. I think that's a way you can pull all the user, maybe try to send an email to them and say something about what has been changed and what's your recommendation for them. So I think that's a way, um, might be less direct, but I think that's a way you can do that. Hey, just another question. Um, what happened when there is a change of the instruments. Um, I mean, Housen just presented uh, that there might be some sort of drift about different instruments, right? Uh, especially for, for, for radiation, that was the example. But at the end, how is that flat or what is the, the consequence of having that discrepancies of the data? Um, so the idea of the QRQC is try to identify the issue and point it out. And we hope that some of the action could be taken by the side team, right? So for example, like a radiation, I just point out. So 
we might might be up to the uh, citing decision to make how they are going to address that. We'll try to provide some guidance about how or what, what typical people can do about that. I think there are some a couple of ways, for example, like radiation, right? There are a couple of resources we can use. Uh, Amerifox does provide some uh, power sensor. So I think that's one way you can try to borrow and use that to benchmark your radiation if you think something is not right. And also there are some practical way you can try to, um, like what we do, compare one sensor to the other and see if the, the relationship stand out from year to year and maybe use that that's, as a way, empirical way to correct your data. So that's just some option. Thank you, Jose. Yes. We do have a question from Tyler Roman. So what do you generally recommend in terms of the site team submitting get field data, flux data? Is that better to hold off so that the U star filtering and get field can be done by a Metflux team? I can take a pass, or maybe Gilberto can jump in anytime since he's doing the standard processing later. I, I would say, if possible, I'll try to provide them um, in the beginning as possible. Uh, there are some benefits. So some people, there are some users just use a base data product. So that might be a good way for them to use this, to have some idea about those data in the early beginning. I think that's a good idea. And there are some delay uh, before the, the base data product can be get field and standardized in the FluxNet, uh, FluxNet data product. So it's always good we try to provide them as possible. Uh, maybe even better is uh, even we have a FluxNet data product, it's always something good about how can we benchmarking a different processing method and also something sometimes we just miss some uh, very unique situation of the site. So maybe the, the version provided by you might be better, I would say. Gilberto, you want to jump in on this one? Yeah, I'll just second that, uh, what, what you described. I think I think it's important that uh, the version that the site is generating uh, be available as well. Uh, one thing that I will note is that uh, data that has been used are filtered and uh, gap filled should be clearly identified with the, uh, with the identifier, with the underscore F identifier, just just so we're not at the risk of reprocessing your data that has been uh, already filtered and gap filled. So identify that correctly with the, with the flag, with the identifier. Uh, and also remember to submit the non-gap filled and non-filtered version because that's the version that we will use to process. But it's absolutely uh, good to, to send your gap filled and filtered version as well. Uh, my question is sort of a follow-up to that. Um, have you guys done any checks as to uh, how similar or different is the standardized processing result to the site PI estimates? I can take a first first cut too. We we haven't done that extensively. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the data that that we have received have not necessarily uh, included the uh, uh, site preferred version, uh, but we did have some comparisons that we did while we were developing the pipeline. Uh, and I will, I will say that in many sites that there was pretty good agreement, uh, but for some sites, uh, especially when the, the conditions were very uh, different or, or not really handled correctly by the pipeline, like sites in the Arctic, or sites in the tropics uh, where the conditions are very different, those uh, had some potentially significant results. So uh, this, these are very useful for us to, to do those diagnostics and continually improve the, the processing pipeline. Uh, Gilberto, if I can add, uh, yes. Sebastian, um, as part of the site visit process, the regular site visit, we do a check of the data processing. And now as part of the site visit like process that we described in the last seminar. That's what we're focusing on in the data processing and differences that we see between the uh, site PI process version and the one that we process. We would process.
So this is great. So I want to stop here. Um, so we do provide a lot of link through the presentation. I know it could be confusing or maybe too many to catch up. So I want to point out, we try to provide all the link here in the very last page and you can always find them. And the presentation and the video will be made available soon. And with that, I, I think we're running out of time. So if people want to stay and chat, you feel, feel free and welcome to do that. I'll stay along. I want to say hello. Or otherwise, I'll see you and see everyone in our next uh, webinar. Thanks, everyone.